platform. Amen. Um, we have been in a series, a little two-part, a little two-part mini-series, and our series, the topic is rest in life. Yes, we know about rest in peace, and we believe that we will find peace in the great by and by, but how many believe that God wants to give us rest in life? Amen. And how many are determined to experience that rest in life? Um, last week, if you didn't get a chance, go back and watch it. If you didn't get to see it, we were talking about how Jesus is giving rest for souls. And what does souls mean? Souls is the innermost being of us, our heart, our mind, our will. Jesus is looking to give you rest in the very core, the very inner parts of who you are and the good news is that Jesus wants to partner with you. What does rest look like? It looks like Jesus partnering with you, taking on the load with you, yoking up with you, and taking the brunt of the load and making your burden easy and light. Can someone say hallelujah for that? I'm telling you, that took me out. Jesus is a wonder in my soul. Amen. So today, we're going to pick that whole theme up and... Um, we're going to talk about an interesting topic called strive to rest. Strive to rest. Can you put that in the chat? Can you say it to someone around you? Can you say it to yourself? Strive to rest. So today, today, this is, we're gonna, we're, this is kind of like what we would call a cautionary tale. Amen. It's a cautionary tale from the children of Israel of what not to do. Amen. We're going to study what not to do. And I, I just have a quick question. Like, how do you learn best? How, were, how did you learn when you were growing up? Um, were you the person um, that you did not believe the fire was hot when someone told you the fire was hot? Was that you? That you, you had to touch it for yourself for you to know that the fire was hot. Which person were you? Were you did you believe it because someone told you? Or did you need to touch it? I just got to see it. Oh, yep, it's hot. I got to burn. What, which one were you? Well, in this story today, I am praying that you will be the person who will believe what is being told to you so that you don't have to bump your head. You don't have to hurt yourself. You don't have to go through a lot of things that what you would go through when you got to learn for yourself, that when you got to just see it and experience for yourself. Amen. Amen. We're going to turn to the scriptures. We're going to Hebrews today. Hebrews 3, 7 through 11. All right. We're at Hebrews 3, 7 through 11. And it reads, therefore, as the Holy Spirit says today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your heart as in the rebellion, on the day of testing in the wilderness, where your fathers put me to the test and saw my words for 40 years. Therefore, I was provoked with that generation and said, they always go astray in their hearts. They have not known my ways. As I swore in my wrath, they shall not enter my rest. Woo! This is, a, this, is a, this is a doozy right here. May God bless God's holy word. What in the world is going on here? This is a rough scripture. What is talking about? What is this scripture talking about? What is God talking about? God is out here handing out punishments like, hey, you're not going to ever enter into my rest. What does this all mean? Well, we're going to have to take a quick story, a quick trip back to the book of Exodus. Y'all remember the Exodus where um, the children of Israel were in captivity. They had been enslaved in Egypt for 400 years, and their cries were coming up to God. And God was like, okay, I'm going to rescue you, and I'm going to deliver you. But if you read those scriptures carefully, God kept saying the reason why God was going to do it. God was doing it for this specific person, for specific purpose, that the children of Israel and the Egyptians would know that God is the God of the universe. They did it. God did all those miracles, signs and wonders for one specific person, for, for one specific purpose, for the people of Israel and the Egyptians, that they would know 
that God is the God of the universe, that God has all power in God's hands, amen, and that they would take that story and pass it down to their children and their children. Whenever they got into a bind, they could always say, hey, remember what God did. This was the specific purpose of God delivering the, the, the children of Israel, but... As we keep reading, along the way, they would run into challenges. Somebody say challenge. And in each challenge, God just wanted them to get one equation. Come on, where are my math people at? God just wanted them to get one equation. You know, like one plus one equals two or like X equals Y. Don't get me too far into formulas. But there's a formula. Anything you times by zero is always zero. There it is. That's the one I could do. God wanted to give them one equation. This was the equation that God was trying to show them all along the way. The same God that showed up for you and rescued you with all these signs and wonders is the same God that will show up for you every time you have a challenge, every challenge you face from now on and hereafter. That was the one equation he was just trying to get. I'm the same God. The same God who did all these great things is the same God who will help you face every challenge that you will ever have. So, God would allow them to go through different challenges to see their reaction. You'll read this all through the book of Exodus, all through the book of Numbers. There was a couple of water shortages, a couple of, couple of water incidents where they felt like they were running out of water. And they're like, what are we going to do? You let us out here to die. We ain't got no water. The water's bitter. It just turned, in, turned into wild, wild, wild. You know, not remembering the same God that brought them from the Red Sea is also able to give them water. It's a whole thing. There was also some food incidences, some food shortages where they felt like they didn't have enough food. God literally rained down food from heaven for them to eat and provide a quail, and then they are, we tired of this food. We want something different. It was always something. They chose to grumble and complain. They even planned to have my boy Moses jump. They was going to jump him and return back to Egypt, return to slavery, and, you know, because that was at least a place where they were familiar. They was going to go back to slavery where they would at least have a, a cot, a two hots and a cot. It's like, as long as we, we just, we want the familiar, we're going to go back to our onion and leek soup. That was a thing that they like. I don't know why. All right. So they wanted to go back to this familiar. But all the while, listen to me, child of God. All the while, God was trying to get them to a place of rest. And that place of rest was called the promised land. All right. This was a place of rest. They left Egypt with a specific person. A purpose to go to the promised land. It sounds amazing, right? What is the promised land? You know, what, what is this rest that God keeps talking about? Was God promising them to go to a spa resort? Is this what God's plan was? What is the all expenses paid trip? When they got there, there would be swimming pools and jacuzzis and they could just chill. There was massages available and you could just live the rest of your life in a perpetual state of relaxation. Y'all ain't got to do nothing. I'm going to pamper and pedicure y'all. And you're just when you get there, it's just going to be a spa resort. Is this what God was talking about? No, I, I really think what God was talking about in the promised land was deeper than relaxation. Even though relaxation is great. We need it for our health, our bodies, our souls, our minds. But I think what God wanted to do was a deeper work. And like we talked about last week, God wanted to invite them into a soul rest. Amen. A soul rest says that no matter what, I trust God. This is where God was trying to get them, get them to. See, they thought that rest meant absent from challenges. Amen. This is what they were thinking. They were like, um, so if we get there, we're going to be straight. <clears throat> no, nah, boo-boo. Um, God was trying to get them to the promised land. And every time God would tell them the promised land, God would say, <clears throat> it's a land flowing with milk and honey. Have you heard this before? <clears throat> 
I guess they were thinking, it's Candyland. We are going to Candyland. It's a place flowing with milk and honey. But you got to read the fine print, saints. A land flowing with milk and honey. And you know what I'm hearing? A land flowing with milk and honey means that there's a land where there's going to be cows, which equals cow poo, and there's going to be bees. Because the only way you could get honey is to get bees. And oh, by the way, there's going to be giants there. Amen? Where is God sending them to? God is sending them to the promised land, but there will be battles to fight in that land. Uh, God was like, hey, I'm bringing you to this wonderful place. It's almost like he was a realtor out here trying to, hey, I got this wonderful place, but the neighborhood is a little sketchy. Just want to let y'all know. God was like, hey, I'm bringing you to the promised land. There's one caveat. Um, there's giants living there. What you going to do? There's giants in the land. It was like when they, um, when they saw these giants in the land, it would be the equivalent of a sixth grade junior high basketball team seeing an NBA team warming up and getting ready for a game. They looked at them giants and was like, oh, no, what, did, what, did, what, what is God doing? God set us up. God just set us up to be failed. We're going to die, right? But the proper response was from my boy Joshua and Caleb. Their response was, we see the giants, and you know what? We're more than able. Hallelujah. We can do this. God is on our side. We have the Lord of the universe. Don't y'all remember what God did to the Egyptians? Don't you remember the Red Sea, the plagues? We're more than able. But instead, the majority saw themselves as grasshoppers in their own eyes. My God, look at here. They didn't even let the giants call them grasshoppers. They didn't even get, they didn't even let the giants roast on them and call them uh, grasshoppers. They said it to themselves. We are grasshoppers in our own eyes. That's a lot of us. We shrink back. We, we, well, we already discount ourselves before anybody even says anything to us. This is what the children of Israel did. The majority said, no, we ain't able to do it. They was even about to stone Joshua and Caleb for their good report. It was a whole thing. You should read Numbers 11 and Numbers 12. So as a result, this is where we get back to the original passage that I just read. God said, you know what? All y'all, you will never enter into my rest. Can't do it. For 40 years, you're going to just wander in the wilderness. An 11-day journey where they should have just went in there, got the land. Instead, they were going to wander for 40 years, and you're going to wander until you die off, and your children will inherit this land. They will enter. You will not not enter. They missed it, y'all. They missed it. They missed the promise of God. And you know why? You know, and I, I I see why. You, you can't enter into the promised land with the slavery, a slavery mentality. You cannot enter the promised land with this mentality. Do you know once they would have got in there with that grumbling and complaining mentality, once they got into the promised land, nothing would have been good enough for them. Oh, my gosh, these grapes are way too big. What are we going to do with this? Oh, my gosh, these houses are so big. Like, I, now I have to clean it all. We have all this land. Who's going to mow this? It was just going to be a thing, thing after thing after thing. And God was like, nope, you, 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 you can't go. Your access is denied. Access denied. And this is why, according to the passage that we just read, this is why they were denied access into the rest, into the promise of God. There were four things. They had hardened hearts. In black folks' vernacular, that means you had a hard head. You was hard-headed. That means you see the right way to do something, but you still refuse to do it. You just being stubborn. You know what to do, and you're like, nah, I ain't going to do it. Hard hearts. They put God to the test. 
You know, they kept moving the goal post on God. They kept moving the goal line on God. Every time God did something, well, well, we want to see you do something else, and God does it. Well, we want food. Well, God does it. Now, now we want water. They always would move the goal line, putting God to the test, even though they'd seen God's work firsthand. This is why access was denied. Also, they went astray in their hearts. This is when you're nodding yes in your head and saying no in your heart. You doing all the things outwardly, but in your heart, you know you ain't going to do none of that. You just agreeing like, yeah, no, I'm not, no. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. This is like going straight in your heart. It's like that one kid. Parents will understand this. Or if you ever babysat someone, you always had that one kid that loves to wander off, like no matter what. And then we look down on the, on the parents who have the little leashes for their little children. They know what they need for that child. That child is always wandering off. We in one store, they down in another store. We got to keep them safe so we don't have heart attacks, wondering where our child is. Always going astray. It's a picture of this little child not staying with their parents and always running off. This is why they couldn't get in. And the last reason why their access was denied, because they didn't know God's ways. They didn't understand what God wanted from them. They wanted their way. God, why don't you do it like this? God, it would make more sense like this. Why did you bring us out here? Why did you? Never knowing what God's way was, wanting their way, not wanting to do God's way because they didn't understand God's way and it was too difficult. So God was like, you know what? You don't know my ways. Your access is denied into the promised land. And they missed it. They missed it, y'all. Please, don't let this be said of our lives. Don't let this be said of our lives. We don't want to miss the promise of God. We don't want to live our whole lives stressed out and worried, concerned, having strokes and heart attacks, having cancers because stuff is eating us up inside. Don't let it be said of us that we lived our whole lives and never experienced the rest and the peace of God, that we lived our whole lives in anxiety and stress and, and always worried and hair falling out and all these things because we never entered into the rest of God. Don't let it be said of us, saints. Don't let it be said of us. So the writer of Hebrews wants us to learn from the children of Israel. The whole purpose of Hebrews 4 is because the writer wants us to learn from them. We have the same choice standing before us right now in the year 2022. The same choice. The same choice in this ancient text is the same choice choice that we have today. Let's turn to Hebrews 4, 1 through 3. Y'all don't mind reading the Bible, do you? Y'all, y'all, y'all good? We're going we just going to walk through a few scriptures because I believe that there is life in this for us. Hebrews 4, 1 through 3. Come on, hang in there with me. We reading the word of God. It says, therefore, while the promise of entering his rest still stands, let us fear lest any of you should seem to have failed to reach it, my God. For the good news came to us just as them, but the message they heard did not benefit them because they were not united by faith with those who listened. For we who have believed enter that rest, as he has said, as I swore in my wrath, they shall not enter my rest, although his works were finished before the foundation of the world. I can stop right here, but I'm going to keep on going. This verse preaches all by itself. The invitation to rest is still open, saints. And it's a place of resting in God's provision. Rest is not an absent from challenges or storms, but instead it's a posture of your soul. Verse 2 sums it all up. Look at it. It's in the highlighted text. Verse 2 says, For indeed the good news came to us just as them, but the message they heard did not benefit them because they were not unified by faith with those who listened. Saints, they kept hearing the word. They kept hearing the commandments, but they didn't mix it with faith. 
when Joshua and Caleb came with that good report, they heard it, but they did not mix their faith with it. They did not stand in faith. They stood in fear. They always were thinking that God was out to get them and we're going to die out here. They didn't mix it with faith. What is faith? Faith is acting like God is telling the truth. Come on here. What is faith? Faith is acting like God is telling the truth. If you just walk out on faith, I don't know what he would do. I'm just going to go on it because God is faithful. And whatever God said, I'm going to act like you got to mix. You have to mix your hearing, the word, everything that you're taking in. Every Sunday that you're tuning in virtually, you got to mix that word with some faith. And you got to say, yes, this rest is for me. Yes, I will walk in wellness. I will walk in hell. I will be who God has called me to be. I'm going to mix everything I'm hearing with faith. Can I hear a hallelujah? So what, what are we to do? What are we to do, saints? How do we do this? Hebrews 4.11 tells us exactly what to do. And this is the title of our sermon right here. Hebrews 4.11 says, let us therefore strive to enter that rest so that no one may fall by the same sort of disobedience. Woo, what a verse. It's a beautiful oxymoron. Strive to rest. It's it's like like hurry up and wait. Like it just, it's mind boggling. What does strive mean? Let's look at the definition of strive. Strive means to devote serious effort or energy to try very hard to do something or to make something happen, especially for a long time against difficulties. This is the, the, what strive means. And if you see in that picture, I use a track example. How many X-Track runners do I have out there? Woo, I, that was one of them, that was my second favorite sport. Love track meets, hate track practices. Um, But if you see in the example, it is a wonderful example. This is what strive looks like. Have you ever seen anybody at the end of the race trying to cross that finish line? Especially if you ran the 400. God have mercy on your soul. God bless anyone who loved the 400 or the 800. You are an alien. What is wrong with you? Why would you want to run a whole lap or two laps and sprint it? It, Whatever. Whenever you get, have you ever ran, seen a runner get to the end of a race and they are striving with every, you got to kick that last 100 meters, and you got to try to get in. And I wish I, I really wanted to show y'all that. So you, you can Google this for yourself. I want you to Google people who dived at the end of a finish line. Like there's one uh, brother in uh, Texas A&M and one sister from the Bahamas at the end of the 400 in the Olympic trials. They got to the end of the race, and they didn't just go for the lean. They went all out and dove across the finish line. It gives me chills every time I see it that they went. That's the example of striving to work hard, to really put an effort into. So what is God saying here? You have to strive to enter into God's rest. It's an intentional effort. It's not something that's just going to fall on you. It's not just going to something that's going to just happen ethereally. You have to strive. There's a lot of things that we strive for. And a lot of times we are striving for the wrong thing. We've been formed in this Western capitalistic society and we strive for all the wrong things. We are not to strive for our salvation. Salvation is free. Jesus paid it all. All you have to do is believe, repent, and accept Jesus as your Lord and Savior. You do not have to strive to have your sins forgiven. You do not have to strive for acceptance from God. You do not have to strive for love from from God. God loves you, and you are accepted as you are. We don't have to work for these things. We're working for the wrong things. We should be striving to rest like we strive to get this money out here. Come on, the way we strive for status and followers and promotions and our careers and and our influence, all these things, we're striving for the wrong things, saints. God has given you this ability to go all out, 
but we got to put it in the right direction, and that direction is towards rest. You have to be intentional, intentional about entering the rest of God. You have to, and how do you do that? How can we be intentional to rest? Well, you could do things like, and, I'm not, and I'm, I'm not just saying rest physically. That is great. But I'm talking about a soul rest, the rest that God offers for your insides, your soul. You could do things like affirmations. Affirmations are a powerful way to continue to practice the things of God. We have our very own family members, um, the members of soul development. They have a wonderful um, apparatus for Kariga and, and, and Fee, they've, they've created a whole book for us, a whole book that comes with a soundtrack of affirmations and, and, and music and how we can really get into how we can be intentional. I've put the information on the side. Please copy this down. Please go order you a copy. This is how we are intentional. We do it with affirmations. We say the positive things that God is saying about us. All right, we could do this through worship songs. We could just play, you know, it's good for us to have our turn up songs. Yeah, it's cool. We got our ratchet songs, and we do that for celebratory purposes here and there. But your whole weekday, 24-7, can't be all ratchet music. You're going to have to turn on some worship and get intentional about getting into the presence of God, for that is how you practice intentional rest. Amen? Amen. And the last thing I'm going to say, and it's very, this was very surprising to me. If you read Hebrews 4 and 11, and then you read Hebrews 12, it doesn't look like the two go together. It looks like, where did this verse come from? Like, hey, y'all, y'all got enough in you to read one more verse? Come on, come with me. Um, we already read Hebrews 4, 11, but check out verse 12. It's going to show us how to intentionally enter into the rest of God. Verse 11 says, let us therefore strive to enter that rest so that no one may fall by the same sort of disobedience. Verse 12, for the word of God is living and active, sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing to the division of soul and, and of spirit, of joints and of marrow, and discerning the thoughts and intentions of the heart. When you first look at it, it's like, oh, okay, writer of Hebrews, where did this come from? It doesn't seem to go with the flow of what is going on in this passage and in context. But if you take a closer look at it, it's telling us that we need to strive to enter into the rest of God. How do we strive into the rest of God? You need the word of God. The word of God is what you will use to defeat the lies of the enemy, to defeat the lies of the devil, to defeat negative mindsets, to defeat unbelief. It's the word of God. Don't forget that the psalm says, thy word have I hidden in my heart that I might not sin against God. We need to hide God's word in the heart so we can fight our enemies. Y'all remember when Jesus was being tempted in the wilderness? He was like saying, I ain't even going to mix words with you. I'm just going to give you the word of God. It is written. It is written. What else you coming with? It is written. This is how we fight the enemy. This is how we are intentional about our rest. You have to use the word of God as a weapon. This verse says that the word of God is like a sword, and it's better than a sword. It's sharper than any two-edged sword. A two-edged sword could cut you both ways. This is what the word does, and it goes deep into our souls, dividing our souls and our spirit into our joints and our marrows. This is where we need to find rest, the very inside of us. This is why even when we rest physically, our minds and our hearts are still all crazy because it's the word of God that gets down deep and gives us rest. The word of God is a hiding place. It's a refuge. This is where we find rest. You have to be intentional to use this weapon when you are tempted. When you are tempted to believe the giants in your life are more than God, you got to use this, this weapon. You got to use it when, you, when you're uh, uh, tempted to harden your heart because you're scared to believe, because you're scared to love or hope again because of past disappointments. Come on, you need the word of God. 
And you need this word when you want to keep asking God to prove God's self over and over again. When you know good and darn well that God has clearly come through for you time and time again, it's the word of God that you have to hide in your heart. And this is how we will find rest. This is a good example of how to intentionally combat thoughts that come with the word of God. Look at this. Look at this slide. It says, you says, and you say, and God says. And this is just a good way. This is a good practice to use the word of God to intentionally go into a place of rest in your heart and your spirit. You might say, I can't figure it out. But God's word says, I'll direct your steps. Don't, you, don't forget Proverbs 3, 5, and 6. I'm too tired. Well, I'll give you rest. It's impossible. Well, all things are possible according to Luke 18 and 27. Well, nobody loves me. I love you. Don't forget John 3, 16. I, won't, I can't forgive myself. Well, God will forgive you. It's not worth it. Oh, it'll be worth it. Don't forget in Romans 8, 28, it says all things work together for the good of those who love the Lord and are called according to his purpose. These are the things that you have to rehearse in your heart. You might feel like I'm not smart enough. God said, I'll give you wisdom. I'm not able. God said, you are able according to 2 Corinthians 9 and 8. I can't go on. Well, God said, my grace is sufficient. I can't do it. You can do all things through Christ according to Philippians. 4 and, and, and 13. I can't manage. Well, I'll supply all your needs. Well, I'm afraid, but I didn't give you a spirit of fear. I feel alone, but Hebrews 13 and 5 promises us that God will never leave us or forsake us. My friends, this is how we intentionally enter into the rest of God. You have to use it as a weapon, the word of God as a weapon. So the invitation of rest is still open to all those who will believe and who will strive to enter into God's rest and stay there. Yeah, because once you get in the promised land, you got to maintain you don't just go somewhere and it's just uh, it, everything is the same. You got to maintain. You got to cut grass. You got to milk the cows. You got to do in your heart and in your mind. You got to maintain that thing. It takes work. It takes effort. It's intentional. But God's rest is more than just about a destination, a promised land. It's a soul posture where you can believe in the provision of God no matter what. No, more, no matter how crazy it is, and no matter what it looks like, no matter what the challenge is, you can believe in the provision of God. Amen? Saints, let us strive to enter into this rest. Let's just go to the Lord in a time of prayer. Can you just remove all distractions? And if this is resonating with you, why don't you just pray with me? God. God of glory, God of the universe, spirit of the living God, we love you today. We thank you for your word, oh God. You sent your word and it heals us. So God, we thank you for the admonition to strive to enter into your rest. God, give us a revelation of what this is. God, continue to let us by faith believe that you have a place for us where we can hide from all the things, all the problems. We have a safe place in you. You are offering rest for souls. But we have to fight to use it. We have to use the weapons to, to go into it and to, and to access this. So, Lord, will you bless us? We don't know what to do a lot of times. We let the problems of life, this pandemic, it all gets to us, and we get worried and frazzled. But we come to you today saying we believe you by faith. We are going to act like what you're saying is true by our lives. God, we want to enter into your rest. We're going to work hard to do it. We're going to do affirmations. We're going to use worship songs. We're going to get into the word of God. We're going to find scriptures for exactly what we're dealing with, and we're going to hide it in our hearts so that when challenges and problems and, and situations and storms and difficult people come, we'll have a place of rest, a place of peace, 
in our heart and in our souls that only comes from you. It's our inheritance. And finally, we thank you for Jesus. Jesus, you made rest possible. Jesus, you are rest. You are our Sabbath rest. And it is because of the work of Jesus on the cross that we have access to this rest. What a benefit. What good news. Lord, we went in a world filled of bad news, filled with news that we always look at 24-7. What good news to know that we have one place that we can go into and we can find rest in you. God, bless our congregation. Bless the people of the way. Even during this pandemic, let us not be rattled or frazzled. Let us look at the realities of everything and do everything on our part. But God, let us enter into your rest. We believe it. We claim it. We thank you for it. In Jesus' name, amen. And thank God.